Hello and welcome to the Pals Anime Lounge, a podcast where a bunch of pals get together to talk about anime. The pals are Artura. Hello everyone. And Goza Girls. Hi. And I'm your host, Ace. In today's episode, we're talking about Sakura Wars, the movie, aka Sakura Taisen Katsudo Shashin, a movie from 2001. I chose this one because it's another one that's been on the list for absolutely ages. It was animated by Production IG, the studio behind Sengoku Basura Samurai Kings, the movie, Tales of Vesperia, The First Strike, and Panzer Dragoon, all of which we covered for this podcast. Sakura Wars, the movie, has a My Animalist score of 6.40. This anime is based on the game series of the same name, Sakura Wars, developed by Sega uh, in the late 90s, and got a reboot fairly recently. Yeah, which I I looked up. Looks kind of good. My synopsis for this anime is A new unit threatens to replace the flower division, but is it as good as it seems? Asura, what do you have? The defenders of Japan, flower division, face a new threat in the form of superior fighting machine that might render their group obsolete. So you said the same thing as me. Basically, yes. It totally (laughs) didn't just make it up on the go. And girls, don't repeat mine. (laughs) During Japan's Taisho period, Hanagumi of Teikoku Kagekidan, based in Daitekikoku Gekijo, must use their Yoshikachu Kobukai to fight Kouma and Tim Burton. (laughs) Okay. Pretty much the same thing we wrote, damn it. (laughs) That Spider-Man pointing Spider-Man meme. So the movie opens on the 24th of December, 1926, or Taisho 15, and a steam-powered Tokyo. A blonde stops walking in the middle of a footpath to watch the snow, whilst on a rooftop nearby, two figures cloaked in shadows watch. It later turns out that they weren't actually watching her, but like that's what, that's what it looked like. Yeah, they were watching something. And I want to say that right away, this... Uh... Like, the animation was really good from the start. I agree. It was notably really pretty in comparison to some of the other stuff we've watched. Like, the the shot where we first see the blonde... uh, I mean, we see the crowd walking and, like, uh, the camera static and they don't really draw attention to her. But she slowly goes the middle and... uh, Like, it's not apparent right away that the focus is going to be on her. I also really like the way they, they use like the light. The, it was so beautifully lit. And, and maybe it's just because I love Christmas, but still. We then get the title credits while watching a musical sequence starring who we assume are the protagonists. It turns out it's literally a performance for an audience by the protagonists because they are the Imperial Operetta Troupe uh, they more specifically, they're the Flower Division, and not all of these names are said near the start. So, you know, Lenny, Maria, Sumiri, Orikimi, Kana, Iris, Ri, and Sakura. Oh my God, we get title drop. We we can end now. Yes, it's a war against that that girl. At this point, you know, since we didn't know anything about it because the characters, well, I. I am so predisposed to assume that any sort of empire or imperial thing is evil that I was like, huh, are these the bad guys? After the performance, we see them in the dressing room after getting changed, notably after they have, you know, gotten changed, and they're joined by Captain Kayama. You can forget about him for most of this. Uh, Oh, 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 wait. Uh, uh, He looks like uh, Apollo Justice. He does. Yeah, you're right. She, she showed up and I was like, like, what's Apollo Justice doing here? Apollo Justice from the Ace Attorney series. We cut to daytime, having accomplished basically nothing in the previous scene, where Maria spots Sumiri queuing up to watch a romantic movie. And she invites her along with some excuse about why she was there instead of owning the fact that she likes romance. That was a romance? I thought it was a western. 
uh, we didn't see anything about the movie. We saw the poster with the title Romance of Something. So, Well, Romance of the Three Kingdoms isn't really a romance, is it? <laughs> As was the style at the time, they see a newsreel before he starts talking about how the Douglas Stewart Company had come to Tokyo from America, with its president, Brent Furlong, promising to help Japan create a better society with the company's advanced science. After the newsreel, we cut away to the blonde from the start, entering the theatre where Kana and Sakura are cleaning. The woman addresses them in English, which neither of the pair are very good with, which makes the dub absolutely insane, with three English voice actors complaining about each other's perfect English. <laughs> That's a good point. I didn't realize that. Oh, I didn't watch the dub. I didn't know there was a dub. I told you there was a dub, I, but I didn't. I didn't watch much of it. But I had to check that scene out <laughs> as soon as. Oh, my English isn't very good. I, I was like. Do they do they talk in English? Like, yeah, they don't even use accents or anything. To, yeah. My English isn't very good. Hello, how are you? What are you saying? Um. <laughs> but but even in Japanese, when it makes sense, it, she, like, curses them out. And, like, I was super offended because, like, that's... Like, that's... I blame her for, like, the custom of teaching other people the swear words in other languages when you meet them. Sakura says, hi, how are you? And the the response is, what on earth are you talking about? And like, that, that's a relevant thing to have said in English. <laughs> what are you talking about? Anyway, we, right? it, it turns out that Blondie was just screwing with them. Uh, she speaks Japanese and just wants to see the manager. Yeah, and that's why it, it was offensive to me, because she was pretending. And, like, that's where the custom started. Like, you meet someone from another country, like, teach them to say fucking shit. We cut to the manager's office, and Blondie has explained a plan to create a New York fighting troupe to complement similar forces in Paris and, of course, Tokyo. Paris, of course, is... I, I didn't mention this at the start, but... Um, this is technically a sequel to Sakura Wars 3, um, which was set in Paris. So if you have been following the series of games in order, you'll you'll already be aware of the Paris thingy. So, um, the protagonist of the series is in Paris currently, be like, because he, he was in 3, he was in Paris. And this is what's happening back in Japan. Yes. Yes. <laughs> so that's why we have no protagonist throughout this. It's terrible. Yeah, honestly, I, I just assumed that Sakura was the protagonist because it's called Sakura Wars. I don't blame you. I did the same. Yeah, it's not until much later that you meet the protagonist, and even then you don't... Mm. We'll get to it. Tokyo had fended off demons, and Paris had repelled the Parishi, which, like, it's just H-I-I -I added onto Paris. <laughs> Blondie finally names herself Lachette Altair, and says that she is now a part of Flower Division. Uh, this is a decision she has made, not the people in charge of Flower Division. I want to ask, in the dub, do they call her Lachette? Because I found out that actually her name is spelled Ratchet. I didn't uh, like. I didn't hear her name in the dub, so I can't confirm. Yeah, it's Ratchet, like Ratchet and Clank. Ratchet. It's not like Ratchet. T T E. It's just Ratchet. I assume she was French. <laughs> well, um, I I use Lachet like four hundred times in my notes, so I'm not changing that. No, 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 no worries. I was just curious. We cut to a shadowy council who are talking about Tokyo and how it's bad to let Americans in, but also good to let Americans in, and how Flower Division is and isn't the best defense for Tokyo. And it just goes round and round, and it's a super annoying scene. B very shredding your cat in, in here. 
We come back to Flower Division, who are drinking tea and discussing Lachette, and how she will likely walk right past them on her way out. She walks right past them on her way out, and Re freaks out, because Lachette probably overheard her talking loudly about her. Yeah, I'm not sure. That's like, anime rules, the voice wouldn't carry that far, unless there's, like, good acoustics in the room. We cut to Brent Furlong, who the music lets us know is evil, even before he pours coffee onto a scale model of Tokyo and calls Japan ugly. That's such an absurd sentence to say. <laughs> well, the music does let us know he's evil, because as soon as he appears, it's like... Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> yeah. Like that. <laughs> One of the dark figures from the rooftop is Furlong's lackey and snaps his fingers, causing an explosion in the distance. We cut to the fire caused by the explosion with dark shadows flying high above. Flower Division mobilizes, getting changed in tubes like their Yzma and Kronk in the Emperor's New Groove. I never, I never watched that. No, how dare you? <laughs> it's like the best Disney movie. The manager tells them that 13 Kuma, aka Fallen Demons, had appeared, and while Moon Division were dealing with the fire, so Flower Division was being sent to kill the demons. They board their steam-powered mechs, and said mechs are loaded onto a train. The train is then dropped down a tunnel, spinning around and around to pick up speed, and then slows down to enter existing metro tunnels, and then launches the mecha to near to their destination. It is an elaborate ass scene. Yeah, it reminds me of that sequence from Waterworld when the mariner like powers up his ship or whatever and like there's a lot of stuff moving and in the end the uh, sail comes up. <laughs> yeah. Here's the thing, I like it when we get to see like the inner machinations and how these things work. But this scene lasted five minutes almost of just looking at the terrain get going off and then just traversing. Like five minutes is a little too much for what we needed. How long is the, uh, what's it called, Voltron? How, how long does, do those se sequences go for? I remember they go through a tunnel and they have to grab on little handles at the top and they like slide down the tunnel on those then they're like in an elevator then one comes out of the volcano no no i, I might honestly don't one remember who knows, that who knows Me like i remember that i i watched voltron i just don't do not remember a, a thing about it i'm not sure if that's a thing in the new one but i think it was the thing in the old one the mechs parachute down next to the Digimon and fight them. Just posted in the Discord a picture of Devi Dramon, which these no. damn things look exactly like. That's the same thing. You cannot convince me it's not. I mean, I was already laughing when you said when they dropped next to the Digimon, but now with this, it's just absurd. Sorry, it's, it's a Devi Dramon and Cyber Dramon which is the next evolution up. But yeah, it's red wings, it's got the, the metal thing on the face, it's got the sharp teeth. They added two arms, and that's it. Derivative work, you see. And uh, then they fight, and Lachette arrives before a flying mech tackles three of the demons, and the fight's over. The, the flying mech lands in a truck waiting nearby, and then drives off while everyone wonders who, what, where, when, why. It, it's it's important to note that the train scene lasted longer than the fighting. <laughs> okay, so the Voltron scene lasts, according to that YouTube video, 2 minutes and 17 seconds. Oh, I found the thing in the new one. Where it still only lasts 2 minutes. <laughs> so, less time than Sakura was. And they're not even doing something cool like joining up. It's just a train. That's to be fair, I really like doing the trains that are going in spirals. I mean, and, and Voltron is pretty stupid because, yeah, they first go down a zip line from the zip line and jump into a, like, a, 
like a water park tube. From the tube, they jump out into a car. They drive the car to the lion. Then ride an elevator up to the lion. That's I'm literally watching it now. That's what happened. I believe you. So later at the debriefing, the manager suggested it was the Americans. And and that's that scene. <laughs> like, there's so many super short scenes, some of which I didn't even include in this because it was so short. It was the Amer- Anyway. Wait, no, please finish that. No, we are done with this scene. That's basically how it felt at times. In the hangar bay, the rest of the team are meeting Lachette, and we find out that two of them already knew her, Lenny and Orikimi. Lenny is displeased and runs off. We never discover why she doesn't like her, but at the Shadowy Council, they are discussing the new unmanned mech built by Douglas Stewart Company, and it, that it could be produced military and remove the need for young girls to pilot mechs. We cut to Lenny petting a dog while Lachette watches from a window. And that's that scene. Then we cut to the Douglas Stewart factory where they have loads of the unmanned mechs. Suddenly, one activates and attacks, I don't know, some guy. I think he was at the Shadowy Council? I think so, too. I I, I was kind of confused, but I felt like we should, we were supposed to care for this guy. The lackey from earlier swoops in and draws a sigil on the mech, which kills whatever was inside of it, covering the guy in black liquid. Actually, it wasn't a sigil. He drew the Mark of Zorro. <laughs> he just Here's drew a Z. <laughs> I was kind of confused because, like, I, I, I didn't realize was that there was something inside of it. So I was like, "Oh my gosh, that was a lot of oil just spilling." <laughs> Brent Furlong brushes it off as a defective product, but when the guy suggests that he might whistle blow, he's bullied into silence. We get a title card showing that it's now first of January, nineteen twenty-six, or Taisho sixteen. At a temple, many people have gathered because it's New Year's Day. Kano barges through the crowd, pulling a rickshaw, carrying Maria and Sumire. Elsewhere, Lenny is with Iris, incidentally the last member of the team to be named over 30 minutes in, uh, and Kasumi, and Iris is complaining because she's literally a child. Still elsewhere, Orikime and Kana are arguing whether Italian food names or Japanese food names are stranger. It's, it's both. And, and then she struggles to eat the thingy that's, like, the easiest thing to eat. How are you supposed to get this last ball off of the stick? I'm the side, you moron. That, that, that frustrated me. <laughs> yes. <laughs> she tries to stick the thing inside of her mouth to get the ball. <laughs> you don't deep throat the skewer. You just turn the skewer. Come on. And she has, like, the most puzzled expression, like, how the fuck do I do this? How do I get that goodness in me? <laughs> no, see, Italian food doesn't use skewers. <laughs> you try putting a, a pasta strand on a skewer. We finish this section with Sakura and Ri talking about fortunes that they've been given and a play, which is where we go to next with rehearsals on stage. But... Actually, it's a daydream that Lachette is having while the team are getting badly damaged, with Lenny and Orokime's mechs going offline. Like, th- this... If you'd have cut out two minutes, three minutes of the train, you could have explained what the hell was going on. I thought perhaps, ah, it's flashing back to why Lenny, Lenny doesn't like her, but no, that's, that's not it. I mean, I could have been the only one that was like, super confused about this whole scene, right? Like, I feel like at this point in the, in the movie, I still didn't fully understand what was happening. Well, we we don't know what was attacking them, why they'd been sent out. What was that rehearsal about? Why were they celebrating a New Year's randomly, but then suddenly not? Yeah, we get the two title cards. Uh, sorry, the two date cards, 24th of December and 1st of January. And there's many days in between and like after and we like the, if you care what data is i mean tough no it's just two days like the first is after 24th right i'm pretty sure that's how it works 
that that yeah. implies that so much stuff happens on the first, <laughs> including multiple day night cycles. Now I'm pretty sure the date times between the twenty sixth of between the twenty fifth of December and the first of January just doesn't exist. We cut to the shadowy council to hear a report that Lenny is injured and a squad of army mecha had dealt with the threat better than Flower Division. The f- decision is made to replace Flower Division, which the ladies aren't happy to learn. Lachette offers to join the army to help command the mecha, but Orokimi says no, she'll do it. Later, the manager is assaulted in bed by Lackey and two others. I mean, that probably needs a little bit more context, but you know what, let's just leave it at that. No, that's that's what happens. That's, that's the scene. He wakes up and he's assaulted by three people. Yeah, yeah, but he, he's assaulted aggressively, not, you know. Assault means lots of things. It's not my fault. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Flower Division are assured that Moon Division and Dream Division are trying to find him, as well as a Count who's gone missing too. Uh, worse, the Imperial Operetta troop has been suspended, so no more shows, with the entire building and facility below being put under army jurisdiction. Orihime is called to take some mechs to fight some Kuma, while the others have to pack up their stuff. Upon arriving at the location, Orihime finds no demons but Lackey. She comes under attack, and we fade to black. Returning to Sakura in a field watching Iris feed seagulls, they're joined by Maria, and wonder if they're ever going to get to pilot their mechs ever again. We cut to the Douglas Stewart factory at night, which Maria has broken into. She wonders why she can't see any internal parts for the mechs, but on, upon opening a door, finds a pulsating mass of Kuma. That, that was just jarring and disgusting for me. I, I didn't expect it, I'm going to be honest. See, I have um, some media literacy, so I knew like immediately what she was going to find. <laughs> yes, it's the problem. It's I'm still too new at this. She tries to escape, but is stopped by Lackey, aka Patrick, because he gives her his name, and he doesn't look like a Patrick to me. So no. she jumps out of a window, and probably she jumped because he doesn't look like a Patrick. <laughs> Yeah, she doesn't look like a, like a starfish. The remaining Flower Division members discover Maria's note saying where she was going. They ponder what can they do with their resources so limited. Sakura suggests that they do what they can. What kind of advice is that? The one that win, wins wars. I, I don't know. Sakura wars. <laughs> They come up with a plan to steal their mechs and take a submarine into the sewers to do just that. Win the Sacro War? <sighs> we cut to Brent Furlong, who is looking out over the city and complaining about it to Manager and two other kidnappees. Like, Manager had a name right now. Uh, every time I hear that name, I just think of Edward Furlong from T2. See, I wrote down Brent Furlong every single time because he's a rich American and like that's what you have to do with rich Americans like the the guy the uh guy who owns Amazon and the, that South African who's now American who owns Twitter Chewbacca yes uh Brent Furlong then reveals that he is controlling Kuma and it's super shocking gasp we return to flower division as they take back their mechs and begin upgrades like, there's more to it than that, but it's basically that. And then we cut back to Brent Furlong, who dispatches the Kuma to attack before Manager goads him about girls fighting battles. I'm not sure what that achieved. As the Kuma begin to attack, I think, like, I don't know what they were att- attacking or supposed to be attacking, a device attaches wires to various buildings and Flower Division balances their mechs on them. Impressive. I mean, the the cables have got to be really, really well attached to those lion's heads. But still, like when when we saw the first mech fight scene, like when when they had to walk and like do some footwork, like they didn't look that good. 
They belong they, in a circus from how well they did this time around. They, 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 they can slide, but I'm not sure they can walk. They fight a bit before Dream Division creates a barrier which vaporizes the flocking Kuma. And then Flower Division gives chase to a mech when it attacks them, and it leads them into an ambush where they have to fight Orihime. She's being controlled, and after a bit of fighting, the lackey with Patrick makes her hurt herself before the unmanned mechs begin to swarm. I'm still not sure why Orihime had to like take herself out of the fight. <laughs> Back at Brent Furlong's place, Captain Kayama... You know, from near the start, I, I told you I'd mention when he comes back in it. And some troops free the captives and then bomb the Douglas Stewart Company factory. Brent Furlong himself is rescued by a big mech, and he flies over to taunt Flower Division while his mechs merge into a gigantic beast. And then he merges with his big mech, and then the big mech merges with the gigantic beast. Uh, I was a bit confused by that, but... <laughs> The Christmas is not even sarcastic or an exaggeration. <laughs> and then he fused with the Earth. <laughs> what is this, Gurren Lagan? Then the Earth fused with the Sun. I'm, pre- I'm pretty sure that what you're describing happens in Gurren Lagan. Then the fusion fused with the Sakura Flower Division. And that's how the war ended. The Sakura War. The Sakura War, <laughs> They fight and uh, Flower Division gets slapped around a bit before the beast is hit by several explosives. Captain Ugami has arrived. My next note was, who? But, <laughs> Same. <laughs> but yeah, he, he's the protagonist of the games. Of course a man would swoop in to save everything. Well, the thing is that the games are a dating sim, so you, you have, the protagonist has to be a man. At least he has a face. <laughs> That's a good point. I mean, I wasn't bothered. I was just more confused. I was like, who is this guy? But yeah, if you didn't know, that's kind of like, yeah, they need to bring a man to save the day. Like, those girls were doing fine on their own. They they would have rocked. I don't know. I don't know why they brought the man back. He, I, he mean, I, I mean, he didn't, he wasn't there through the most of the thing. He got mentioned like three times. They didn't even show his face. A photograph, a drawing. They de- didn't even say how he looks like. Actually, when when he gets back to to Tokyo, it's like a character is talking to someone who was on the boat with him, and that character's like, yeah, he's already left. <laughs> it's like, we we couldn't afford this actor for more than a day so he had to get all of his stuff done really quickly so yeah he wasn't in this scene because of a a reason we'll come up with even though they didn't have to pay the actor to turn up they 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 should have just teased him throughout the throughout the thing like every few minutes oh he's he he's been here he's on his way oh he's just passed right through here oh he's almost there and then he never shows up and the movie just ends without him. Like, <laughs> the story concludes. And we never see him. <laughs> Noticing something, Re explains that the creature is being controlled by sound, which equates to her pelting the thing with missiles. Yeah, I didn't quite get that. <laughs> yeah. See, they... Again, if they'd have cut back the, the train scene... They could have explained that the reason that the that they were kicked out of their headquarters is because their performances were interfering with this, like the the mechs somehow because of this sound frequency. But no, I'm just going to shoot some missiles and yeah, next next boss phase. We needed the train scene. <laughs> it was the UK train. I'm just imagining. The storyboarding sequence, like uh, discussing it, and four or five days of back and forth. No, we've got to get rid of. No, we. This has to stay in. We'll sacrifice this bit later. I mean, they clearly had a like. Again, animation is like superb. Like, I don't think I found one section where the animation became subpar. But it's like maybe there's like somewhere a bunch of like lost footage that they never 
uh, sent to printing, <laughs> where the whole story suddenly makes sense, <laughs> but they just run out of time. Well, the the day is one with the power of friendship, also Sakura falling at terminal velocity, and uh, it fades away into feathers. Elsewhere, Patrick is running across rooftops when he's stopped by Maria, who survived, and uh, she shoots him with a bullet that Re had mentioned earlier, because it was a magic bullet. Chekhov's bullet. Hmm. Yeah, uh, I'll we'll come. We'll circle back to that. Um, we cut to a production at the theater. Lachette goes off script, and apparently wants to kill Sakura. But everyone remains in character and talks her down. Except she stabs Sakura. But it was actually just a part of the performance? Double fake yeah. out. Too, too confusing. If there's like three people saying, oh no, this does this isn't supposed to happen. And they're all speaking the same way they're supposed to be speaking in this opera. And then ah stab ah there's blood and uh, yeah i'm fine okay bow <laughs> yeah we don't know enough about the play to like determine to, to see our determine ourselves what is she doing differently because maybe she's just 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 started saying something personal but again because we don't know how the play is supposed to go it's just completely lost on us we don't know what's happening so not only do we have to play multiple Sakura Wars games, but we also have to watch me- multiple three-hour operas. Are you sure that's a real opera, though? No. <laughs> exactly. It's like you need to we you need to send letters to the creators. Please, please finish that opera. I need to know what happened in this scene, and to know what happened in this scene, I first need to learn that opera that you didn't finish. <laughs> The movie ends with Sakura walking through cherry blossoms and smiling at the camera, which could imply that she is dead. Credits. <laughs> so, was this a good adaptation? Uh, I think so. There wasn't much dating. There wasn't any dating. I mean, in Japan, a date can be just girls hanging out, so that counts, kind of. Well, uh, in my opinion, not really, because the monster and costume designs in the games are beautiful and unique. The ones in this anime are generic. And the Kuma, as previously stated, literally looks like a Digimon. Or a couple of Digimon. I I spent about an hour trying to find the specific Digimon that I was trying to think of. I like the dedication. That looks like Red Eyes Black Dragon. So Yu-Gi-Oh! stole from Digimon as well? I mean, probably. In my opinion, I didn't think it was a very good adaptation. Uh, it, it the, the game, the Sakura Wars 3 is Paris Burning, focuses a lot more on like, the dialogue and the character connections. And this one's very combat-focused and very like mech-heavy. And I couldn't really find that many mech scenes to justify making the entire movie about the fight sequences. Mm, you, have, you have a point, I guess. So, is it a Yata, a Nani, or a Baka Artura? I'm going to say this one's a Baka for me. I really liked the animation. It was really pretty. But I was very confused for a lot of it. There were some things that felt really necessary, unnecessary, like the train scene. And it just, there were some things that felt like very convolutedly long. And other things that didn't get a lot of attention. And finally, that final fight sequence is very by the book. So something happens and then they figure out how to kill the big bad. And then they kill the big bad and everyone's very happy. And it's like that it felt all very inconsequential. No character matters. No character gets any actual things happening to them. And nothing really transpires over the hour and 20 minutes. And goes. I want to say Yata because like, I don't think it's for me. But, like, the animation is just so good. Like, it's... Like, the the story is its biggest uh, weakness, I, I, I think. But, like, it... I, I wasn't questioning what's happening on the screen where everyone is, stuff like that, because the animation was good, voice acting, sound design, stuff like that. 
like I'm, I'm, I'm gonna assume that someone who's a fan of the series would get more out of it than me. So I, I want to give it a Ayata because it's, yeah, again, it, it makes up for everything else with just, uh, I don't know, production value, like good animation, good sound design, good voice acting, characters. Uh, I, I can tell characters apart. Uh, they're well, you have like their own characters clearly, even though they don't have much screen time, stuff like that. You can tell them apart, but name three of them. Oh, Sakura, Reni, and Ratchet. Also, a Commander something something who goes missing. That's the, that's a fourth one. For me, it's a, a backer. The action scenes are dull. The opera scenes don't seem to factor into any of the plots. And we get that Lachette is a newcomer and hated by Lenny, but we don't know why. And we don't know that Lachette even gives a damn that Lenny hates her until possibly the opera at the end. Like, if that's indeed the point that the opera was trying to make. So does it deserve its my analyst score of 6.40? I, I felt that's a bit high. Again, I love the animation, but everything else is the slog fest. I could have watched this at quadruple speed and understood most of the things I did understand because everything else is just not explained anyway, even if you do take the time to read it very slowly. I, I think that score is fine, probably. Uh, again, like it would, it, it it might make a bit better animation real than a movie or maybe a bunch of shorts, because the animation is really good. Like, I I could pick any moment and I can just appreciate how a scene looks and plays out. Okay, I. So the animation, as you said rep repeatedly, Gauze was great. The voice acting was decent, but the plot was just kind of generic. And it was a, it was a. Arthur, you said Chekhov's gun. Well, this was a Chekhov's armory. There were multiple. Yeah, guns. <laughs> Ugami. Oh, he isn't here. Oh, he came back just in time because we mentioned him multiple times. Uh, I meant to give her this magic bullet. Oh, she uses the magic bullet. Like almost all the plots were resolved with a, a Chekhov's. <laughs> Chekhov's yeah. army is so hilarious, though. Yeah, the more I think about it, I because it's set between like uh, the third and fourth game, right? So it, it like. It gives you an idea what happened in Japan during the third one, or 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 towards the end of the third one, or after the third one, something like that. And like we don't need a lot of it. Like if you know the series, you know those characters. You don't really need a lot of time with them. Just get get to the plot. Which, yeah, they didn't. It, it's very slow. But the animation is so good. <laughs> and even, like, like the, the 3D stuff, I noticed that, like, how good the cell, cell shading is on the on the mechs or everything 3D. And oftentimes you get, like, 3D stuff in anime that just, just looks jarring and plasticky. Galarians. I was gonna say, are you talking about Galarians again? <laughs> like, I, I can, I, I can appreciate Galarians because that was like early three uh, D stuff, but it doesn't look great. And here, it looked great. It's blended together with the uh, hand drawn animation. Okay, that about brings us to the end of this. Thank you for joining me, Artura and Guzgos. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you. And thank you for listening to the Pals Enemy Lounge. And uh, yeah, thank you for subscribing wherever you found this episode. You can find more from us on GameGrin.com, find us on social media, and listening to the Greencast podcast. Until next time, game on. <laughs>